Okay, let's get on with part two here, wherein we talk about plant defense responses. So, this is what happens when plants defend themselves. We'll go through our roadmap here, in which we talk about the different types of defenses, in which we have anatomical or chemical, the different types of poisons plants will produce, whether they be secondary metabolites or various specialized poisons, uh, various interesting chemicals um, for defending against herbivory, or even uh, helping to colonize and uh, limit competition, which is pretty cool. Then we'll talk about coevolution uh, for symbiotic animals that protect plants. Uh, and finally, we'll talk about a really cool feature of plant defense, the systemic response. When plants uh, only produce defensive chemicals when they're under attack, which is pretty amazing that they can do that. And that's the roadmap. Away we go to the two classes of defenses, right? So anatomical are actual physical structures. So we are talking about things like cactus spines, which are modified leaves. We're talking about thorns, which are modifications of a stem. Uh, trichomes, which can carry sticky stuff or nasty chemicals, right? So um, these are anatomical defenses versus chemical defenses where we're talking about poisons right irritants and my favorite category other and away we go into plant poison right we're gonna like shout out to anatomical defenses because quite frankly you know it when you see it I mean, cactus spines, thorns, right? These are pretty easy. So we're going to go into the chemical defenses. And we're going to start off talking about the types of poisons you see in different plants. Uh, so first off, your poisons can come in the form of secondary metabolites. So a secondary metabolite is defined as uh, something that is not part of the primary hormonal system. So, these may be byproducts of metabolism. Uh, so, Basically, anything that's not directly involved in development or reproduction. So, secondary metabolites are things that are not part of the primary hormonal system and are not involved in development or reproduction. Uh, these are energetically expensive to produce, right? that costs us lots of them precious ATPs. <coughs> a plant has to devote a fair amount of energy to producing enough poison to protect it. Right? Uh, and these secondary, these plant poisons are obviously for defense, primarily defense against herbivory. Um, an important part of plant poisons is that the toxin does not affect the plant, right? We don't want to poison ourselves when we're producing a poison to defend us against herbivory. Um, we can do this in uh, an interesting, uh, uh, two basic ways, one of the simplest solutions to make sure the toxin doesn't affect the plant is to just 
keep it in a membrane bound uh, structure, a uh, membrane bound uh, vacuole. So as long as it's in this membrane bound vacuole, right, it is not exposed to the rest of the cell. So the cell is safe from the toxins as long as the vacuole is intact. The other method, which is kind of cool, is to have it be not toxic uh, inside the plant. But it becomes toxic when uh, metabolized in the intestines of an animal. So that's pretty cool. There are a variety of plant defensive chemicals that are indeed uh, stored as a non-toxic form, um, but that become toxic when introduced to the digestive system of the organism that ate it. And let's go into a big example. Cyanide! Okay, so cyanogenic glycosides. Sometimes I've seen it written glucoside as well. I don't think there's any big difference, but I wrote glycosides. So that's me. Cyanogenic glycosides uh, basically are falling under that not toxic in the plant, but toxic when eaten. So when ingested, right, so if a herbivore ingests uh, cyanogenic glycosides, their digestive system breaks it down into, honest to goodness, cyanide, which, you know, not all that great. Cyanide uh, stops electron transport chains and thus stops all cellular respiration. So cyanide inhibits, it inhibits the electron transport chain and thus basically starves you of ATP. That's how it kills you. Cassava is a native root plant that evolved in South America, but got exported to Africa. And it can grow in just the worst conditions. And it's pretty reasonably rich in nutrients. The problem is that the skin of cassava produces cyanogenic glycosides. So uh, you have to go through um, some important steps, right? A lot of people will soak these things for like three days and then pound them and then air dry them, right? Just to try and get as much of that cyanide or cyanogenic glycosides out of the skin make it easier to eat. We also have cardiac glycosides. So cardiac glycosides are sodium potassium pump inhibitors. So they inhibit the sodium potassium pump. The sodium potassium pump is required for neurons and muscles to work. So these cardiac glycosides shut down the heart because they shut down the muscle's ability to send and receive electrical signals. So uh, not great. Um, what's interesting about cardiac glycosides is that you can use them in extremely low doses uh, and you can use them as a treatment for uh, heart uh, uh, heart patients. Specifically, 
extremely low doses, doses of cardiac glycosides can slow heart rates. Uh, and it can help soothe arrhythmias. Uh, an arrhythmia is when your heart starts beating off tempo. Uh, it is an indicator that you're having a heart attack. Um, cardiac glycosides uh, are produced by plants in the South American rainforest. Uh, and then insects feed on those plants and build them up in their system. And then frogs eat those insects and build them up in their system. And then the frogs become poisonous. Right? And uh, some South American tribes actually dip their arrows in, uh, in uh, skin from dark frogs. That's why they call them poison dart frogs. Uh, if you keep poison dart frogs or you see the ones at the zoo, well, the zoo isn't going out of their way to feed them something, you know, horribly toxic. So they don't set up the whole plants that produce cardiac glycosides and feed them insects full of them. So poison dart frogs in captivity, non-toxic. Milkweed, uh, the weed, actually produces a cardiac glycoside. Um, so it can be lethal to vertebrates. In, in high concentrations, uh, milkweed can be lethal to vertebrates. And it can very quickly build up to toxic concentrations in many invertebrates. So milkweed is kind of dangerous. And yet there is a butterfly supremely adapted for uh, eating milkweed in its life cycle. The monarch butterflies, right, they lay eggs on milkweed. Milkweed, right? And then the caterpillars eat that milkweed. And then the caterpillars uh, take in the cardiac glycosides and accumulate them as a defensive uh, thing. They, they take those defensive cardiac glycosides and accumulate them in their own bodies. And... When the monarch, uh, when that monarch caterpillar undergoes metamorphosis, and you get a pretty butterfly out of that chrysalis, well, guess what? It's still poisonous. So the monarch makes great use of cardiac glycosides produced by the milkweed. It's uh, so effective at being poisonous, right? Here is a happy bird, and it has caught a tasty butterfly. And it says, oh, I will now eat this butterfly and have a good time. Oh, it tastes terrible. Right? So a bird very quickly learns not to eat a monarch butterfly. It tastes awful, and uh, it tastes, you know, poisonous. Uh, so the Viceroy butterfly is actually a monarch butterfly mimic. It evolved to look an awful lot like the monarch, despite the fact that the Viceroy does not take advantage of milkweed. So that's kind of cute. So uh, they call this Batesian... Mimicry, where a non-poisonous species mimics a poisonous species. So that's pretty cool. Um, and that's all thanks to those cardiac glycosides that build up in milkweeds. 
alkaloids. So alkaloids uh, is a general category of compounds that are alkaloid in nature, right? So this is not like one good example. There's uh, we've cataloged more than 10,000 different plant alkaloids used in defense. Some good examples would be caffeine, right? If you look up online the number of pets you can't give caffeine to, you'll start to understand why caffeine is good as a defensive chemical, right? Nicotine, that's harmful to a lot of invertebrates. Uh, cocaine not helpful to a lot of vertebrates uh, morphine produced by the poppies right that kind of gets you a little high uh, it's a activity depressant and then there's good old d lysergic acid so uh, morphine is a product of the poppy right as far back as 5000 BCE we have evidence of people uh, cultivating poppies and using them recreationally so we have evidence going back as far as 5000 BCE for people using poppies as drugs in fact the poppy is one of the most infamous flowers in the history of mankind because not a lot of other plants have had wars fought over them, right? People have fought wars to secure supplies of poppies. People have subjugated others, right? Uh, so it's a pretty fascinating thing. It's not that the morphine buildup in poppies uh, basically um, causes herbivores that eat it to become a little listless uh, and a little low on activity levels. And it makes them easier targets to their predators. So that's the hypothetical deterrence model for why the poppy produces morphine so that herbivores that eat the poppy become listless and get uh, low activity levels and become easier predator targets so that's kind of neat nicotine right this is from tobacco plants uh, and it disrupts insect metabolism So this can possibly kill insects, and while we can't ask an insect, it probably tastes bad to insects. And we have d lysergic acid. Uh, it is a rather powerful hallucinogen. We find it in a lot of morning glories. So... Um, these are intensely toxic to uh, pets. Don't grow morning glories and let your cat feed on the leaves or the petals. Uh, so the hallucinogen, I mean, if you get your herbivore high, it's more susceptible to predators again. So um, what's interesting is that magic mushrooms recently decriminalized in Denver also produce dealer lysergic acid but fungus are more closely related to animals than plants so that is yet another example of convergent evolution d lysergic acid production in morning glories and in uh, magic mushrooms next up are the tannins right these are named because they were used to treat hides animal hides and make them stronger uh, more workable and more durable so 
if you've ever heard the term tanned leather. That's leather that's been treated with a tannin. So, tannins can be found in high concentrations in barks of woody trees. Uh, you can also, so this is, uh, it's in high concentration in barks. It's in the past been used to tan hides. Um, and it interferes with protein digestion. in herbivores. So, not great. Uh, not only do we find it in bark, but we also find it in pretty good concentrations in wine grapes. And we also find it in uh, tea leaves. So, a lot of the species of plants that we use to brew tea from have tannins in them. And they are a herbivory defense mechanism. So, that's kind of cool. Um, then there are plants that can produce various oils. Uh, oops, uh, this isn't my tea leaves. Look at that. I was just giving a shout out to tea leaves. <laughs> this is actually my peppermint sage. Peppermint sage is interesting because it produces an oil that smells an awful lot like peppermint. And that, uh, that oil, that peppermint oil produced by peppermint sage, has some kind of repellent effect on a number of different insect herbivores. So, these oils can help defend the plant against herbivory. So we've gone through a lot of cool... Uh, a lot of cool mechanisms of chemical defenses against herbivory. Now, let's talk about something super cool, and that's chemical defenses against your neighbors, right? So plants don't just want to uh, defend against herbivores. They want to defend against competition, right? What are they competing for? Water in the soil, nutrients like nitrogen in the soil, right? And sunlight. So if you have a bunch of similarly sized plants grouped around each other, uh, they are going to all be in pretty intense competition for these uh, various uh, necessary chemicals, limiting resources. So, allelopathy is a chemical defense against other plants to limit competition. It protects plants from other plants. which is pretty cool. Uh, generally what happens is the plant secretes various chemicals. All right? So it secretes chemicals from the roots. It can also secrete them from the leaves in certain species. So uh, most species that uh, do allelopathic uh, defense secrete it from their roots, but um, for instance, the black walnut tree pictured here, right? This one secretes allelopathic chemicals, not only from the roots, but also from uh, the leaves on the branches. So when the leaves fall down, they build up that allelopathic stuff. So it's pretty cool. So they're secreted by the roots and basically, they minimize competition. They create conditions 
that inhibit growth of competitors. So we can see in this diagram of my black walnut, we've got a lot of different sources of our allelopathic chemicals. Right? Uh, leaching from the leaves. So you can have chemicals leaching from the leaves when exposed to rain or fog. Uh, you can have the chemicals being released during evapotranspiration. They can be secreted by the roots. Uh, if you have roots that are disconnected or broken or sloughed off, they can be released from those roots. And then any decomposing leaves, fruits, or twigs on the ground will also secrete those allelopathic chemicals. Uh, so this is why black walnut uh, pictured here, right, is a pretty amazing plant. If you look, there's no vegetation really growing under it. If we could see a better view, you'd see that there's actually a fair amount of dirt surrounding the base of the tree. Uh, it's native to Virginia, grows from Maine, west to Michigan, and south to Texas and Georgia. Uh, the chemical that it produces is called uh, I never know how to pronounce it, juglone or juglone, I'm not sure. But this is the allelopathic chemical in black walnut. Um, it inhibits the metabolism of any plants exposed to it that happen to be sensitive to it. And another secondary metabolite would, would be phytoestrogens. So phytoestrogens are estrogen-like plant hormones. For instance, soy produces phytoestrogens. Soy produces some interesting phytoestrogens. When you increase your soy in your diet, you build up phytoestrogens. Now, phytoestrogens don't guarantee an effect. For instance, the phytoestrogens from soy uh, can bind to your estrogen receptors, but they bind weakly, and you have a high resistance to those phytoestrogen effects. So... Um, Soy foods, uh, recent research seems to be indicating that they're not as, uh, they don't have as strong an effect on the endocrine system as we once thought, right? So um, they still probably have some kind of disrupting effect, but it's probably much lower than initially thought. Uh, so any plant hormone uh, that can uh, bind to human hormone receptors uh, and cause an effect is an endocrine disruptor. Phytoestrogens have shown some uh, endocrine disruption effect. Right? Uh, there's a lot of studies out there about phytoestrogens and their effect on people, but uh, it is still very much in the air whether or not there's actually any kind of significant effect. However, when it comes to non-human animals, we can actually see a pretty neat uh, endocrine disrupting effect. So this is the California quail right here. And this is its range from the Pacific Northwest right all the way down into Nevada and the hot, dry parts of California. So... Um, Throughout the year, uh, the quails eat um, nice little uh, grasses called forbs. Um, these are nutritious grasses that they feed on, and they feed on the seeds. However, during drought, they have to eat uh, desert plants that have high concentrations of phytoestrogens. 
eat desert plants during drought, whoop, a lot of their options dry up and die. So during droughts, they eat desert plants, and those desert plants have large phytoestrogen content. And when the California quail is trying to survive these droughts, it would appear that the phytoestrogens actually interfere with reproduction. They seem to have some kind of inhibitory effect uh, on the reproductive system. Uh, remember, this is only as long as they are eating it. So this goes away once they stop eating phytoestrogens. So the phytoestrogens inhibit the reproductive system. Um, and this is actually pretty cool. The, young, the quail doesn't lay any eggs for uh, offspring that would be kind of doomed by the drought. So you're not wasting energy reproducing um, when there are drought conditions that will drastically decrease offspring survival rates. So that's pretty cool. Phytoestrogens uh, can have a selective benefit, uh, and they do for this California quail. We can compare it to the scaled quail, and you can see the scaled quail lives in hot, dry ranges where their primary food source is those uh, desert annuals rich in phytoestrogens. Um, and with the scaled quail, the phytoestrogens have no effect on ability to reproduce. Uh, and this would be because those phytoestrogens were basically their only food source, so they co-evolved to tolerate those phytoestrogens better. Which is neat. So they have a limited diet available, but in eating the same food source, they don't have the same effects. The Pacific Yew. The Pacific Yew is an evergreen tree, um, and it produces a defensive chemical called Taxol. So, Taxol is fascinating. Um, it is a defensive chemical, right, during the Taxol synthesis pathway where you go X, Y, Z, Taxol. Some of these intermediates here are pretty good at uh, defending against insect herbivory and parasites. So these intermediates defend against Insect herbivores. Wow, this thing is freaking out. <sighs> and insect parasites. So these are pretty cool defensive stuff. But the final product in this pathway, Taxol, is noted because it is a pretty neat anti-cancer compound. Taxols fight cancer, right? Uh, taxols inhibit the mitotic spindle in cancer cells. Um, and that inhibits their ability to grow. 
So uh, it's actually one of the big, um, one of the big uh, first drugs that had an anti-cancer effect. In fact, humans liked Taxol so much because it could treat cancer so effectively that the Pacific U was nearly driven to extinction. Right? In fact, it would have gone extinct if it weren't for the fact that some scientists figured out how to create synthetic Taxol in the lab. So the Pacific U is recovering because we are now able to make Taxol in a lab. So this is the modern range of the Pacific U. Pretty sad, actually. It used to have a much larger range, but eh, you never underestimate a person's desire not to die of cancer. Okay, quinine from the cinchona tree. Okay, so quinine. It is directly toxic to insects, right? And so it'll kill insects and in vertebrate herbivores, in larger herbivores, it has the effect of inhibiting protein digestion. thing. There we go. So quinone is directly toxic to insects and inhibits protein digestion in larger herbivores. Uh, quinine is really fascinating because it has an anti-malarial effect. So taking quinine orally can kill malaria parasites. Uh, the, as, as far back as the 1600 CE, um, Incas were treating malaria with uh, a, a tonic from the cinchona bark soaked in water. It was bitter as all get out but it was anti-malarial which is pretty cool uh later when the spanish rolled it or not the spanish but later later when the british were coming in um they brought gin with them and mixed it with that tonic in order to mask the bitter taste of it so gin and tonic uh, literally comes from a genuine anti-malarial uh, concoction. So it's not just a drink that you t drink to sound fancy. Uh, you actually have a history of anti-malarial action, which is pretty cute. We now have synthetic quinine, uh, so we can produce it in a lab. However, the synthetic quinine, right? So we have synthetic quinine made in labs but the plasmodium of malaria is becoming resistant to uh, the synthetic quinine which means we're actually starting to see a comeback of uh, good old 1600s to 1900s gin and tonic well, at least tonic with the naturally sourced quino, uh, or quinine. Quinine seems to be, quinine from the bark seems to be the most effective treatment. Again, well, at least it seems to be more effective than the synthetic treatment, which is pretty cool. I'm getting close to done, my friends. All right, animal symbiosis. Co-evolution with animals and not in the terms of pollination, rather in the terms of uh, housing and protection. So a great example of symbiosis between animals and plants is certain species of ants and the acacia trees, right? So there are ants that live 
in acacia thorns. So they make their uh, colony in the acacia thorns. And when they encounter them, they attack uh, insects. They attack parasites. The ants will attack epiphytic plants. And they'll even attack larger uh, mammal herbivores. They'll swarm them and bite with their unpleasant bites. So the ants uh, get a wonderful source of protection in that thorn, and they provide the tree with defense, but that's not it all. There are some acacia trees that actually generate food. Uh, so some acacias actually produce nectar for the ants. So we get accumulation of nectar in the thorns. And uh, this kind of gets a little sinister, but um, in some acacia ant symbiosis events, the acacia produces a nectar that causes chemical dependency. In other words, the ants essentially become addicted to the acacia food um, and the ants can't digest uh, other food, right? So in one case, the acacia nectar uh, produces um, a, a chemical that inhibits uh, an enzyme that breaks down sucrose. So ants living off this nectar can't digest sucrose, which is the most common plant sugar, right? So they can't digest sucrose because of the nectar they've been drinking. But the nectar conveniently provides them that enzyme so that they can digest the sucrose in the nectar. Oh. Uh, what's also fascinating about this is that the ants are not the pollinators of acacia, acacia trees. Acacias have bee pollinators, but ants will attack anything. So the flowers actually secrete a, uh, a, a pheromone that uh, sort of pushes the ants away. So the ants don't get near the flowers, and thus the bee pollinators can come and uh, pollinate the flowers and not have to worry about getting devoured by overly protective uh, addict ants. Just when I thought I was done, PowerPoint screws up again and freezes on multiple slides. So now I get to do this again. Everybody loves doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over. Okay, what is the systemic response? Um, well, the systemic response is actually pretty neat. Uh, we already established that producing poisons and other chemical differences is energetically costly, right? Keeping, basically keeping uh, poisons uh, or other chemical defenses up in the proper concentrations is really ATP expensive. That sucks. The systemic response is a way to try and save on costs. Right? Rather, rather than having a poison or other chemical concentration at defensive levels at all times in all parts of the plants. The systemic response is a way to basically not have any of it around until it's needed, right? 
So you produce your chemical defense only when and where it's needed. That's pretty cool. That gives you a pretty big cost savings. Uh, you need sort of a hormonal cascade, right? Uh, so there's something that causes the release of a signal. That something is pretty much always damage. So damage to the plant starts the cascade. Um, they generally refer to the first hormone involved in the cascade as systemin. So this is the initial hormone of the cascade. Basically damage to the plant stimulates systemin to be released by that damaged tissue. Systemin travels throughout the entire plant and then triggers the response where necessary. Um, one of the most common products of the uh, systemic response is a proteinase inhibitor. ASE means, uh, what do we got here? It's an enzyme. So what you are doing is inhibiting protein digestion. So at the very least, whatever just ate you isn't going to get any nutrients from it. Uh, so jasmonic acid right here that's a uh, proteinase inhibitor um, it can bind to digestive enzymes and shut them down uh, so that's kind of funky uh, in tomatoes uh, you get salis or, uh, in, in tomatoes you see systemic pathways also in willow trees you can see a systemic pathway the the willow is pretty cool the white willow tree because its systemic pathway produces salicylic acid you might know salicylic acid as something else aspirin aspirin's pretty heavily toxic to insects so uh and in like it, it can get pretty toxic for your pets too um so you know when it's something that where the doctor says don't take too much for too long because it'll cause your stomach to bleed you know that uh the main focus of the chemical isn't relieving your headache it's actually a plant defense chemical produced in the systemic response of the white willow that's pretty sweet oh my god i have to make another recording because powerpoint keeps not recording or this software something isn't recording slide transitions and it's not recording the stuff i draw oh my god this is an insanity this this is the last slide, I swear. If this screws up, I'm going to, like, write a strongly worded letter to Reader's Digest. Ah! The last slide I want to talk to you about is a really cool mechanism of plant defense in which the plant chemical being released doesn't directly attack the uh, the attacker right so before now all between you know all the little chemical stuff that can uh, harm the attack the herbivores um, or the systemic response which produces a chemical that harms the herbivore uh, those were all things that directly attack the herbivores but here's something that's a really cool artifact of coevolution for defense 
in which the chemical is not the thing destroying the herbivore. So we start off with a hungry, hungry little caterpillar. And this hungry little caterpillar wants to just eat as many leaves as possible. A single caterpillar can destroy a large number of leaves before it gathers up enough nutrients to metamorphose into a butterfly or uh, turn into a moth or whatever it is. So as it's eating a leaf, the leaf releases a volatile signal. Now, volatile here means that it uh, diffuses into the air. Now, the signal is detected by a parasitoid wasp. And the wasp just follows the signal concentration through the air back to the leaf. At that point, this wasp detect, or finds the caterpillar. And what a parasitoid wasp does is it lays its eggs on and in that caterpillar. Shortly after the larva hatch and the caterpillar is eaten alive until it dies. And guess what? Dead caterpillar doesn't eat. A dead caterpillar is not hungry anymore. Yay! So in this case, what happens is that the chemical defense signal from the leaf is purely uh, an attractant for a parasitoid wasp that lays eggs on the caterpillar. And it's the wasp and its uh, parasitoid larvae that actually defend the plant. I just think that is a really, really cool mechanism for plant defense, a really cool artifact of the complexities you can get into when you're looking at the coevolution between plants and animals, right? The plant is protected by an animal. The plant isn't protecting itself. It's attracting a protector, and that protector just happens to be a parasitoid wasp. Parasitoid wasps are cool. Because uh, parasitoid wasps are horrifying. Um, in fact, and this is real, Charles Darwin uh, started having doubts about his faith in God when he observed parasitoid wasps laying eggs on various animals and then watching the larvae eat those animals alive. Uh, he actually wrote in his diary about how he had doubts that there could be a benevolent, loving God that created a parasitoid wasp. So, anyway, uh, parasitoid wasp defense. Super cute, you guys. I'm geared. I'm done. I hate you. I had to record a third slide. Slide. Lecture whatever close